Okay. Um, uh, before we get started, um, uh, first of all, I'm cold. I'm not trying to look holy. I'm sorry. Um, but second is um, uh, for those of you who have questions, it might be best because the second half is supposed to be uh, question and answer, I think. Um, it might be best to keep the questions to um, the end of the, of the talk part. Um, because it'll be hard to see whatever was written at the beginning. So it might get ignored, not intentionally, but because moved down. Um, so I want to thank, um, of course, Abuna Gabriel Wisa and Abuna Anthony Murad um, for asking me to uh, participate. I'm a little nervous. Um, and God bless their ministry. They're doing so much stuff for all of us right now. That's really helpful. Um, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Um, I was asked to talk about keeping, um, keeping our eyes on the Lord. And I'm, I've got to say this is harder for me because I'm used to, um, I'm used to talks that are more quite, quote unquote, in, instructional. Um, uh, whereas to me, this is, um, much more of a meditative one. Um, so I'm going to just maybe meditate with, with all of you on um, different ways that we keep our eyes on the Lord biblically and, 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 and then end with just maybe some ideas of how to, how to do that. Um, Behold, you are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are doves. Um, this is from Song of Songs uh, 115. The first thing that came to my mind about keeping our eyes on the Lord um, is romance, uh, the divine romance. That's how I, I usually see it. And so that's why I think it's hard for me to uh, to talk about the what or the how of all of this. Um, because it's intimate. Right. Um, there are so many ways that we can do this. So I'll, I'll start with the rom with that of the romantic eye. Right. A youth that's in love, anyone who's in love, really um, often is stupidly in love. Right. Um, and what they mean by love is usually romance. Um, and romance makes people do things they would never do. And it makes people stop doing things actually that they that they used to love to do. Um, it makes rich, it makes poor people rich, right? They feel like they're rich with what they have. And it makes slaves out of rich people. And it's because the person has their, their head in one place and one place only. And that's with their lover. And so our, our, our Lord gave us the Song of Songs as a book of of divine romance between the soul and himself or between the church and himself. And so if, if my eyes are on my lover, then I'm going, I'm going to recognize his role as provider and nourisher. 
I'm not going to be worried about it because it's not, it's actually his. That God as our romancer takes on this, this very masculine role of saying, don't worry about the food. Don't worry about the drink. Don't worry about the house. Don't worry about the clothing. I'm going to take care of it. Are you with me? Do you love me? Or are you loving me conditionally on what's going to come with the package of me? And so in following with this idea of romance, I really care more about my lover than my luxury, if, if I really do. Then if we as a couple are, are forced into a time of poverty, then we'll go through poverty together as long as I'm with my lover. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let my mind or my heart or my being leave my lover. I'm not gonna let them leave God Himself. In fact, um, in the story of these lovers in the Song of Songs, there's a time where the spouse uh, gets lazy. Uh, she hears the knock of her lover and she completely ignores him. She's going to bed and she usually would have run to open. She would have done all those things. And then she just doesn't. She's not into it. She's not feeling it. And then she comes to herself and she now wants him and she can't find him. She didn't open the door and she can't find him. And it sets her heart ablaze. And she remembers her first love. She remembers the romance and she goes sprinting out and begging and knocking and calling and screaming and shouting saying, give me back my lover. I need to behold, I need to see my lover. I miss him, I need him. I had gone to sleep, but I'm awake now and I want him. Her eyes, even in her anguish, were on her lover. Her, in her anguish, she wasn't asking, um, how am I going to eat? In her anguish, she wasn't asking, who's going to pay rent? Her eyes, even in the midst of her pangs and of her sorrows and her screaming out and her crying in pain, all of them were all for one thing, give me back the eyes of my beloved. Let me gaze into his eyes and behold his beauty and be um, consoled. Because it's the gaze of our lover. It's keeping our eyes on the eyes of our lover. That's what's going to give us the look of healing and consolation. It's in his eyes that I'm going to find that. So remember that God is first and foremost our, our lover. St. Anthony the Great, the great saint, um, greatest saint, said that if you have a place, if you find a place, don't easily leave it. And he was talking about um, the cell on some level. But the idea has a secular application to it well, as well and spiritual. The idea is that if you are still, if you're not moving around, if you're not going from one place to another, one problem to another, one job to another, one significant other to another, when you stay still, when you are attentive, you learn about yourself and your God through your stillness. It's a different kind, but it's still the same kind of keeping your eyes on God. In this kind, um, you keep silent and weather the storms because the storm is teaching you. The storm shows you your weakness and um, 
your and your places of imbalance, not in a chastising way, not in a chastising way, not because he's saying now they're sitting here. Let me let me do stuff to you. No, no, no. It's in a natural way of revelation. So if you if you use the same chair as a poor example for a very long time, you find out if it's sturdy or not. Right, you've got your eyes on the chair. If you weather um, insults and demands, you find out about your ego. If you stay still and put your eyes toward God, you know what you really believe about things when it seems like the world is crumbling, but you also find out who God is. Right? It, it, it shows you God's faithfulness. The sturdiness of the chair, the fragility of your ego, you, when your eyes are on them, you found those things out. When your eyes are on God, you find out that his gaze is also directed at you. If you sit still with your eyes on him for a long time, you find constancy, consistency, stillness. You find that you're actually not so easily moved to emotions. You're not easily disturbed. You're not easily worked up by things that others might be, that you won't even notice they are, because your eyes are where they need to be. Your eyes are on the Lord. Um, Peter, St. Peter the Apostle. St. Peter asked to do something impossible to man, right? St. Peter had his eyes on God walking on the water and said, I want to do that. So he asked to walk on water. God did not hesitate. We often think it's God who will not do the thing that we're asking. But here God obliged him completely. He just said, okay, come. Go ahead, come. But that wasn't enough for Peter. Peter's eyes were still secular. His eyes were still materialistic. Um, like we just read earlier today in the in the story of the, the man born blind. He received his physical eyes first, his secular eyes. And secular eyes look down. Right? If Peter had looked up, right, looked straight, gazing forward, he would have maintained his gaze on God. He would have maintained his link, his connection with God himself. But that's not where they went. They went down, right? His, his eyes went down to the earth. His eyes went down to the waves. The waves are below him. They're not above him. Right? He looked below, and he looked down, and so he looked with those eyes. And the minute his eyes were turned away from the truth, from the light, from God himself, from that source of stability, from the source of his power, from the source of the one who gave him the ability to walk on the water, something that doesn't belong to man, once he turned his eyes away, he began to sink. His not keeping his eyes on the Lord was shown by thinking materially while saying the words of faith, right? He said the right things, right? He didn't say anything um, that wasn't true. He said the right words, but his eyes weren't on God. He had the form of religion and not its power. He didn't have Christ. He could say the things of God, but he didn't, fully believe them. His eyes were elsewhere. And Peter lost eye contact again with God when he betrayed him. And we know this because God makes eye contact with him after the betrayal. One of the Gospels gives us that extra detail of, and then our Lord looks at him. When we lose sight of God, we lose sight of the meaning of our relationship and our romance. 
it becomes a lot easier for us to deny. It becomes easier to lie. It becomes easier to be swayed by the slurs of society against the truth. To the point that we join in ourselves and sometimes we swear we have nothing to do with the truth. Yet looking into God's eyes just once, it sent Peter running in shame. He had lied to and about his lover. But when he looked into the eyes of his lover, he didn't find rage. He didn't find anger. He didn't find chastisement. Just the look of the lover to his beloved. And that was enough to send Peter to his room and say, what have I done? He was so caught up in the moment, so caught up by the environment, so caught up by how everybody was feeling, what everybody was saying about the situation, what everybody was saying even about his Lord. And he got swept up in it. He joined them. He joined them. But just by re aligning his gaze into the eyes of God was enough to fix him. There's something about the eyes, right? There's something about the eyes where we have it. We have it as an expression in English of saying, look me in the eyes and say that to me. Because we have this, this sense of you can only look into someone's eyes when what you're saying is true. When, what you, when you know you're innocent, when you know you love the person in front of you, only then can you be bold and look the person in the eye and say, this is the truth. But once we're not living in that truth, our eyes avert, our eyes look down, our eyes look elsewhere, or we avoid even being in the presence of the person altogether. The Lord said that the light of the body is your eye. If your eye is in darkness, the whole body is in darkness. Just stop for a moment and think about that. Right? The Lord is saying the ability of your whole body to see is through your eye. So if your eye is dark, your body is in darkness. You're blind. He's saying that even, even though you have eyes, Without light, you're blind. It's light that gives vision to vision. Right? Earlier today, Christ said, so long as I'm in this world, I am the light of the world. Your vision requires light to work. Otherwise, it's just an organ. In the absence of true light, you can't see in spite of your eyes in spite of your eyes being open you could be in darkness so if you're in the dark if you're stumbling in the dark where should your eyes look i would say it should be for a switch for whatever light is there we're going to use whatever light is allowing us to see even a little bit to find the switch so that we can turn on the light, so that we can see. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. If your eye has strayed from light, aren't you going to stumble? It's not a punishment. It's just what happens when there's no light. Are your eyes looking for light? Our eyes are on the love of the world. Our eyes are on our lover. Our eyes are on Christ. He is the true light. Do you look for Christ in these times? 
Or do you look to yourself? I think some of us are busy talking about how bad other people's darkness is right now, instead of putting our eyes on Christ. Right? That to me is, is the premise. Someone's going to say, what does that look like? I think that already looks like something. Like, I think there's something more romantic about not having the, here's the step-by-step, -step. if you do this, you arrive. But here are some ways to have your eyes on him during this time, and in, 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 in just as an offering from some reflection. Avoid debating people's theologies. Don't spend your time looking at what other people are talking about our Lord walking on the water. Look at the man walking on the water. Don't be like, oh, well, Peter said this, and James said this, and this guy said this. Don't be some, this happened in this video, and this person, just avoid debating. Avoid debating. Avoid trying to speak for God. He can speak for himself. If my eyes are on my lover, and I don't mean that even in the in the in the angry go get him kind of mentality. No, I mean it from a loving mentality. I mean it from the sense of if my eyes are on my lover, I'm not interested on what everybody is saying about my lover. I'm talking to my lover, and my lover hears them. He hears what they're saying because I'm with him. If he wants to answer, he can answer, but I'm with my lover. Avoid negativity. Okay, avoid talking about how dumb something is or how bad something is or how much you you wish you could have actually had something else instead of what you have. Instead of talking about what service you wish was being offered, instead of wishing how you think the situation should be dealt with or should have been dealt with or wasn't dealt with or any of the things where you spend all of your time finding out all that's wrong. You won't enjoy the presence of your lover because your mind is not with him. Your eyes are not on him. Avoid gossip, right? Avoid wrong speech. Avoid useless information that leads to useless conversation. In short, what I'm saying is avoid darkness. All those things that are not him or in him are not light. They're not light. This is why St. Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about those things. That's what St. Paul says. Everything on this list is positive. If my mind strays from God, who is all goodness, if my eyes are on him, they're on something that is not true. They're on something not honorable. They're not, they're not on something just. Because he is all of those things, the perfection of those things. That's why if we're eyes, if we're not talking about things that are either of in him or of him or to him, you're going the wrong way. Right? You're going the wrong way. To keep our eyes on light is to keep our eyes on nothing but truth. So keep, during these times, objectivity. If it's not true, cast it off, or at least don't cling to it, right? What is truth? Jesus Christ. Have your eyes on him. If you're watching him, you'd see how he lived in the flesh and how to be the gospel. This is the time, I think, where we shouldn't be asking the question of how right or wrong Others are living the gospel. We should ask the question of, how do I live the gospel? 
because the gospel is the truth and our Lord is the truth and is the gospel. If my eyes are on him, I see the gospel and then I can become the gospel. Believe the best of everyone during these times. That everyone on some level, even if you think that they're wrong, is trying to find out how to live the gospel during this time. Believe that of them. It's not your job to assess the relationship with their lover. It's not mine either. It's my job to be faithful to my lover. And my lover said to me, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I look at my lover and I ask, Lord, what are your commandments? And he says, oh, my commandments are not many. It's love me and love all my kids. Love, love all of us. But then, God, what does it mean to love? Because you started this whole thing with love being a commandment. So what does it mean, Lord? And he said, oh, I'll tell you what love is. Love is that you lay down your life for everybody else. Love is that you listen. Love is that you don't blame. Love is that you don't accuse. Love is that when somebody wants something, you let them have it. Love is that when they are tired and they need to go for a walk and they demand you to walk with them, you say, okay, I'll walk with you. That's what I'm asking from you, is to love my kids and to love me. That's, that's what I'm asking. If you love me, then love me. Choose me. Choose me. Choose my kids. Don't choose you. If our eyes are on him, that's what we see, because that's what he did. He didn't say that and not do that. He really did that and does that. In the liturgy, we say, the eyes of everyone wait upon you. For you give them their food in due season. It says their eyes, the eyes of all, wait upon you for their food. You would think that it should say, all bellies wait on you to nourish them. That would be sensical. But it doesn't say their bellies. It says their eyes. Because it's in our gaze that we encounter the eyes of those we love, right? It's in looking at our lover that we get our answer. It's in our gaze. It's in this looking that we intimate our thoughts, our feelings, and our needs, right? That's why those who are so intimately connected can say, I know that look, I know exactly what he's thinking. I know exactly what she's thinking right now. I know what she's trying to say. I just had to look. I just had to look. There's no need for us to articulate when we know one another, when we can truly see one another. Those who love the earth are earthy, says St. Paul. They having eyes do not see. So let's walk as children of the true light. Let's, let's walk as his children. Arise, O children of the light. If we live like that, then beholding our Lord, we will see the light of transfiguration. And like scripture said at that moment, that moment where they were blinded by the light of the glory of God, that when they opened their eyes, it says, and then they saw Jesus only. May God grant us the eyes that see him and through him, um, now and always the age of ages. Amen. I think now is the question time. We're supposed to be half an hour talk and half hour questions. So um, if you guys have questions, now is the time to start writing them. Um, as we said at the beginning, um, if you want to write your questions to do it now, uh, to not have to find them through the, the top and get lost in the, in the chat box. Um, so one question is, praying and keeping vigilant at home isn't an easy thing to practice despite the great importance in my life. Um, uh, I need some more tips on how to overcome laziness, boredom, and busyness for prayer. 
Um, and is it okay to remember your confessions during prayer so you're humble before God? Um, so a monk, when he enters a monastery, and I'm going to a monk because um, some of you guys are being forced a little bit um, in this in this time. A monk is not actually given free reign of his time because a monk who tries to become a hermit is, is not going to be in a good place and he'll, and he'll suffer spiritually immensely. Um, and that's why there needs to be balance. I'm really suggesting to a lot of people, this is the right time to write a schedule and stick to it. I hate schedules. I'm not saying it because I like schedules, but because schedules are helpful. I was saying I'm going to do my work from such time to such time. I'm going to spend time with my family no matter what from such time to such time. I will spend time in prayer, reading, meditation, et cetera, from such time to such time, as a, not in, in addition to your whole disposition, of course. Um, what you'll find is that you still have a lot of free time, not the opposite. Um, and it also doesn't mean not spending more time on different things. It's saying making sure that time is spent on certain things no matter what. So um, that will help you combat your laziness, I think, and your boredom because you now have an actual structure to your life. Um, it's a good time to restore um, meaning, right, of having direction to your life because I think so many of us live by reacting to every single moment, which means that we were void of meaning, thinking that we were being meaningful. So I would, that's just, that's my, my, my suggestion. Um, and maybe reach out to your spiritual father and find out if you should have a modified um, canon or rule during um, Lent. Um, is it okay to remember your confessed sins during prayer to help for God? It depends on how you're using your confessed sins. Um, to me, a remembrance of old sins is helpful when I'm being fought with arrogance or pride or judgment, right? That if I'm looking at someone's sins like, oh wow that guy's doing that that sometimes helps me like wow but i'm the guy who did the exact same thing and worse and actually maybe even still does i'm the guy who um except for the mercy of god and his forgiveness did all of these things so who am i to judge so i think remembrance of sins is is useful in the context of when i'm being fought with um arrogance i'm not saying it's the only way or the best way or the way i'm saying it can be helpful in that way. Apart from that, I'm not sure that it's useful for us to um, spend our times in negativity. As we just read earlier from St. Paul, that's not the place for our mind to go. I think it'd be better for, and more productive for us to instead look at how good God is as opposed to focusing on how evil and bad I am. Um, uh, love Ku, I'll answer yours at, at the end, uh, the icons in the room. Um, if we confess, why do we have to ask mercy for our sins when we have no sins? I'm not sure I know what you mean. Um, I don't know if you are responding to Joseph or asking a different question. Um, so... There's nothing wrong with us putting our weakness before God, regardless of sins as the number, right? If I recognize myself as a sinner, as opposed to um, having a list constantly, right, of saying, Lord, I, I had said I wasn't going to cuss yesterday. I cussed four times. I'm so bad. But I confessed about the first four. I haven't yet confessed about the three more I did this morning. There's nothing wrong with coming and say you 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 cuss, okay? But it's different from saying, Lord, I'm in need of your mercy because I'm one who is diseased and constantly chooses to live in disease. Help me to be healthy. Right? So it, it really just depends on what you mean when you're doing it. So I, I don't know how to answer directly, um, because I don't want to get legalistic about it, right? Um it's, it's more important, I think, for us to have a disposition of, of knowing who God is and who I am, and then everything emerges from that relationship. Um, is it bad to discuss the different theologies from different faiths? 
Yeah, like it, it depends, right? I don't think it's healthy to build your teaching by attacking someone else's wrong teaching. We just present the truth. So I think sometimes, um, sometimes it might be, uh, it might be necessary to point out a way of thinking to make a point, but not to attack. So for example, if I want to say, um, I'm emphasizing this point because I think culturally we have adapted such and such a mentality, that's fine. You're not making an attack, right? It's very different um, than saying, unlike those Protestants who say blah, 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 blah. Unlike those Catholics who say blah, blah, blah. Unlike those Byzantines, unlike those, um, because then it doesn't even get into other traditions. It gets into our own. Unlike those who are Taba um, and the right? Whoever is a follower of Bishop so and so, we start. Um, we just start building off of a platform of wanting to point out how wrong someone is, and that's not even what Christ did. Right when Christ came, he said, I am the truth. Here's what I'm saying. Right? He didn't stand there and say, Unlike the pagans who think this, I am telling you, do this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this. He, he just was, right? He just lived. So I think that most people, when they're discussing other traditions, are usually using it to be negative. And I'm not in saying this, saying that we don't disagree with doctrines and traditions of the churches. We do, otherwise we would be them. I'm simply saying that's irrelevant most of the time. So I do think that it's usually wrong to discuss it, not always, um, but that it's especially wrong when it's being used in an arrogant way or being used in a way to, to not be perfect. Um, Is it wrong to use social media or watch a movie or show for the purpose of enjoy enjoyment? Um, I don't know if you mean during Lent or in general. Um, if you mean in general, um, then I would say in moderation, no. If it's not intrinsically wrong, right? Basically, the way to make any decision is to always start off with, does the gospel have something to say about this? Right? Does the church, is there a teaching about this? Is it intrinsically wrong? Yes or no? If it's a no, Case closed, right? So is TV or social media intrinsically wrong? No, they're not. I might feel that way sometimes, but they're not intrinsically wrong. So then the next question be, how am I using it to aim? Is there something wrong that could be there for me? For example, if I know I have an addictive personality and someone invites me to something that's not wrong, but I know that once I start, I can't stop, then I should say no for me. Even though it wasn't intrinsically wrong, it was actually wrong for me. So that to me should be step step two, um, right? And then third is to monitor it and to be honest about it of did the circumstances change? Did it start to become wrong um, or not? So in general, is it wrong to do those things? No, in moderation. Um, during Lent, I do think personally, because there's no dogma about this, I do think it is good for people to refrain as much as they can from those things um, as a time of sanctification from those things. I know things are different when you're home 24 seven, so I'm not shaming anybody who's not. I'm simply saying, um, those are the ideas behind it. And so it would be good to go and get advice um, from your spiritual guide about how you can, because you might also snap, right? If you go from like 100 to zero in a day, um, you might suffer. So make sure you get some um, guidance on that. Uh, okay, better wonder has rephrased. After you confess, you have no more sins. So when I do individual prayer, I have to say, have mercy on me when I have no more sins since I've confessed. Um, yeah, so I think I did understand that. So, I, But I'm glad you clarified to make sure because I wasn't sure. But 
I would still say yes, but not in terms of like, like listing, right? Like it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be like, okay, now I need to say these things again, but it's more about coming as a, with the disposition of knowing that you're, you're ill when you're asking for mercy. That's what I'm saying. One asking for mercy is asking for mercy on something. So the mercy on something is my sick self, right? So that, that to me should be the disposition. Confession of specific sins, I think, should be done. I actually think there's a place for that, right? That that to me should be like um, at some set time of the day where you come back and you're having conversations with God, with God and saying, here's what went well today. Here's what didn't, right? Like in in cussing, I showed the, the lack of sanctity, God, that you gave. I, I cheapened it, right? I made things not true. In, in dishonoring my parents, I was showing them that I think I'm more important than my parents. In lying, I was completely anti your existence because I wasn't truth. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry because, the, here's the important part, because I am in your image and in your likeness. That's a gift you gave me. So whenever I misuse it, that sin, whenever I misuse it, I am taking your greatest gift so cheaply, and for that I'm sorry. Can you fix it? That's what we're doing. So that to me should be the approach. That's my personal view on an approach to prayer. It's not the only way on the approach to prayer for confession. Um um, a great number of times in prayer and quiet time, the mind is in a state of to and fro, constantly distracted and cannot focus. Um, what are some steps to some level of stillness? Um, excellent question. Um, number one, consistency, right? That's why the schedule matters. Consistency, 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 consistency. If you... Just do it on whim. If you just do it when you're in the mood, if you just do it randomly, you are much more going to be subject to this to and fro. Consistency is so important because in, in having consistency, you've created the atmosphere and the disposition of that dialogue. You're not talking to somebody randomly. You talk to someone daily. And so therefore, you've made sure that there's always a context of this dialogue. Even if some days you don't feel it as much others, no problem, but you're there, okay? That's number one. Number two is to recognize that this is not unusual. Um, it's demonic um, sometimes, and I'm gonna get to the part where it's not. Evagrius of Pontus, he's one of the most wonderful um, desert fathers when writing about prayers, talks specifically about the demon that comes to you right when you're praying. That makes you yawning, tired, achy. And the minute you're done praying, you are full of energy and life. Right? Suddenly you're like, yeah, let me pull out my computer. Let me pull out my phone. And you're with it. Whereas a minute ago, it was like you could not stand at all to stand. So one is recognize that part of this is a tool of the enemy. Um, and that part of your fight is to persevere. <laughs> right, is to say, I'm going to do it anyway, okay? Um, and the third is to make it, is to recognize who you're talking to, right? Direct your prayers at God as really God. Direct your prayers not at a thing, not at an it, not at, at, a, at a that, at a who. You're talking to a who, and a who is a, is a being, right? The who has a personality, right? The who has, has characteristics. The who, the who has, has a history with us. So talk to that person, right? So if you're holding your prayer book, direct the words at the who, not at the book, right? What are we saying when we say this? How is this true? Because if you do that, you'll find that the Psalms, they become relevant to you. 
you will learn what Psalms match where you're at in life, where sometimes David is saying, I love you so much. You're amazing. There are days where David or whoever wrote, because there's other authors too, where, where someone's writing, God, I am in the worst place and life sucks. If you could come out and play right now and say something, it would be greatly appreciated because I'm giving up. There are other times where he's saying, I'm in trouble. It's my fault. Help me. And there are other times where he's saying, this time it is not my fault. You better come through. Pay attention, right? And there's way more, right, of finding which ones match you. And Psalms are not the only way of prayer. But I'm saying even those, right? When you're talking to him, are you talking to him or are you talking at him? So I would say those are some of the ways. Make your prayer um, conducive to your state. Don't walk in from craziness, and jump into prayer as though it's going to happen naturally, right? Like when I come in from craziness, I just finished a lecture. I have 40 text messages that just blew up my phone, and I'm about to step into a conversation with somebody, and they're like, okay, first thing, did you do this and this and this and this? What are most of us going to say? Listen, just okay, could I calm down for a second. Um, I need a moment. <laughs> can I just, like, regroup myself? And then I can answer your question, okay? Madish, I'm sorry. Do you do that with prayer or do you just come in from the whirlwind, right? There's a famous story of the desert falls of the monk who started going doing the laps around his cell. And so one of the other monks was like, Abba, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm just trying to get rid of my thoughts so that they don't come into my cell with me. So before you go into pray, calm down, warm up for prayer. For some of you that might be doing something from the psalmody, it might mean singing a spiritual song. It might be sitting in the dark for five or ten minutes um, to calm down. It might be reading a chapter from a book. It might be um, reading something in the Sayings Fathers. It might be um, gazing at an icon. Whatever it is, those are, none of these are, are bad. Warm up, calm down, let your thoughts get back to Christ, and then enter into dialogue with him. Um, I think that might help you a little bit with stillness. Um, I hope that was a little bit healthy, so helpful. I'm sorry that was really, really long. Um, sorry, I'm trying to find where I was, um, so I don't ignore anyone. Uh, I love you too, Abuna Prodos. Um, being at home triggers some toxic addictions like watching inappropriate things, alcohol. How do we overcome these addictions within the realm of our home? So if you're at home with other people, help yourself by letting yourself become um, accountable to them. Let them help you. Because if you're trying to take your own will in your own hands, it's not going to work. As, as you have said in the question, it's an addiction. By definition, if you're addicted, it means that you've already kind of lost your self-control and authority. And that means it's maybe good to let someone else help you. So if you're comfortable to tell them, tell them. I'm not saying you have to. But if you're not comfortable, be with them more. Right? If it's watching things, Maybe make a rule of not using your, your, your phone or your computer or whatever the source of what you're watching is in private, right? Making sure that those things are, are, are outside, right? And having some control over your time, like, like the schedule thing is helpful with that too, I really think. Because it's like, no, I can't because right now I'm doing this. But find things that you like doing during this time, not just on your own, but with others, both. And then you're not going to have time, right? The Desert Fathers are really big on the best way to deal with bad thoughts is to have good thoughts. Because the more you give time and energy to a bad thought, the more power you give it, right? So... You can say, all right, I'm going to have time where I am going to be reaching out to others. I'm going to ask about people. 
no matter what. We're going to chill. We're going to get online. We are going to have some Zoom party or whatever party we're using now because everybody's Zoom bombing, right? And we're going to play a game. Right? I'm not even saying hold hands and kumbaya. Like, you can if you like. But I'm saying, like, even playing a game, that can be righteous and holy and fun in these times. Right? I'm saying, okay, who else is alone right now? So even if you're alone, who else is alone? All right, let's chill. Let's do one, two, three, four, five. Okay? Um, find out who in the household needs help. What project you want to do. And then once you have put a schedule and once you start following it, you'll be able to identify when you're usually falling and then you can you can be more um tactical in your in your war um um is it allowed once a person is baptized in the coptic church the coptic orthodox church and follow the orthodox christian to go and attend the worship in a protestant church because the family are protestant I don't want to get into deep answer on that, not because of of, of fear of reaction, um, as much as I think there are sometimes pastoral aspects to this that need to be seen specifically in your own case um, that might require specific guidance from your spiritual father. Having said that, is it right to go pray with the Protestants in their churches um, at the risk of sounding really bad and, and mean to people, my answer is, is no, we should not. Um, and it's not because I think they're bad and it's not because I think we're better. I wanna make that very clear. It's because we believe something to be true Okay, if you believe something to be true, how can you go and participate in somebody who believes on principle that you are lying? Most people, when they ask this, look at it from the opposite perspective. They look at, oh, it's because you think they're bad. It's like, no, they think I'm lying. Right? They, they believe that what I believe about the Lord Jesus is a lie. If they believed it was true, they would also agree and would be saying what we say. But they don't. On principle, they believe we are wrong. Right? And so if they want to join us, Ahlan wa Sahlan, right? Welcome. And that's what I'm saying. We don't, we don't, we don't kick anyone out. But I'm saying that my, my participation is a sign on some level of agreement. There's a reason why, even though I don't think Jews are bad people, I don't. I also believe that they are among the people of God. They, they, God loves them. I don't go pray in a synagogue because I think they are incomplete in their knowledge about God and that they are objectively wrong in their assessment of my Lord. So I do think that it is not right to, to, to participate. That's, that's my view. Um, I also recognize that pastorally, there may be actual exceptions to that, and it is not my place to dictate to anybody their specific situations but just that they should have that principle in mind and seek guidance. Otherwise, they might be doing something that, that might be wrong. Um, how does the church attack situations such as killing movies or modern things that aren't stated in our Father's works or in the Bible? How do we know what the church says is correct? So the church is only claiming to be absolutely correct about dogma. We're not claiming to be absolutely correct about anything else. What we're claiming and what we're hoping that everyone's trusting is that we are to the best of our ability trying to rightly divide the word of truth. Might we sometimes get it wrong? We might. We might. We might socially get distracted, right? We might do it. And that's why we, try, we, we tend to be slower to taking things up because we take seriously wanting to know if something is right or, or wrong, 
right? So what we do is we use three major things to try and assess to the best of our ability. We use tradition, the, the fathers, we use liturgy, and we use the Bible. And we try and hold everything up to the light of those and say, how does this look like when we hold it in front of the light? Does this look safe? Yes or no. And admittedly, we might make mistakes sometimes. That can happen and that's, that's okay because we're not claiming it to be a dogma. We're not proclaiming a teaching of the church as a dogma when we don't know, right? That's why I don't see I don't see a dilemma um, behind um, the, the the question. What I would also say is because some people ask that question with it with with an attitude of, oh well, since the church could get it wrong, I'm going to do whatever I want. No. It's like saying that a doctor can make a diagnosis. Or the doctor might have suspicions, but because he's a doctor, we'll take it seriously. Because the doctor is saying something's going on, even if he hasn't diagnosed it yet. And so I can't walk away from that and say, well, since there's no diagnosis, I'm just going to do whatever I want because I know. Okay, so just be careful with where that question goes. I'm not accusing anyone asking of having that, but I'm saying in case anyone listening took it in that way. Um, uh, now at a time when we do social distancing, is it time? Is it okay to make an online confession with your parish priest, um, like WhatsApp, email, etc.? Um, yeah, that depends on your priest's uh, bishop. Um, I, I I know that many bishops are allowing their priests to do so um, as an exception during these times. Um, so you would need to ask, but I, I imagine that most people, that is what's going on right now. Um, I want to say that that should not be the norm, okay? Um, just so that we don't, because an exception was permitted in great need, that that should not become a norm. Um, where we have e-confession and, and all of that, that's not that's not a thing. Um, discipleship should be, I, I think... Um, usually not like that. Um, hi, when I'm very addicted to music, not necessarily bad music, and I cannot go a day without it, should I change the habit, and is it a sin? Yeah, um, I am a big music person myself. Anyone who knows me well knows that. Um, I love music, and, and, and not all music is bad, like you said. Um, I do think it's a good idea, because one, something enslaves me. Even if it's not an intrinsically bad thing, then it has become disease to me right so and which is sin um so for example if it like eating eggs isn't a sin but if i eat only eggs every day for 10 years i'm gonna have health consequences right and 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 the egg wasn't junk food right so yeah i think it would be good to get some exercises on how to on how to come to a balance of it not necessarily to get rid of it completely but how to have um, a right approach to it. I think my time is almost up, so I will do um, one um, more question um, before I go, unless Abuna Anthony Moral tells me to stop. Um, I'm looking for your message, Abba. Um, okay. Um, last one. Um, um, I'll go with you, Michelle Asif. I'm a convert to Christianity from Islam, a Muslim country, and I believe the Orthodox Church is the true church. What should I do if I can't find any churches here and my parents um, don't accept? Um, first of all, um, Welcome to the family, brother. Um, and I'm so sorry about your situation. Um, until I met somebody um, who um, converted and how isolating that can be um, and how even among Christians, we don't always um, treat our new members with understanding of knowing how difficult it is, what, what your lifestyle might have been like in your pressures. 
I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I saw it. Um, but what I saw also is that God doesn't leave people when they have been persecuted for the truth. So God, I am confident, as I'm sure you are for making that decision, is and will be with you in all things at all times. So take consolation number one in that. Um, I would suggest to you specifically if you can reach out to um, Abuna Anthony Murad um, through uh, COA. Um, he might be able to put you in contact, I think, with somebody I know who went through and sometimes goes through um, what you might be feeling right now. And I think it would be better for him to give advice than me um, about how to deal with those situations because he comes from the exact same um, background and condition. So I'm sorry that it's not an answer, but I wanted to acknowledge it. I didn't want you to feel ignored even online where you're probably trying to find any kind of community. Um, and I, I would say to the community, um, maybe outreach a little bit and, and look for people like Michelle, maybe even um, find a way to message him um, and include him in your online shilling and in your fun and having conversation. It might be a way to do it. Um, the, um, yeah, I ran out of time. All right, so thank you all. Um, I ask you to please keep me in your prayers. My time is up. Um, and thanks once more to um, Father Anthony Murad um, and Abuna Gabriel for their love and for their humility. Honestly, they they should probably be running this every week. Um, let's just end with uh, our Father uh, before we move on. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We ask you, Lord, to hear our prayer through the intercessions of your Holy Mother, Theotoko, St. Mary, the great Abba Antony, St. Pope Corliss and Mary Mina, with prayer with all thanksgiving. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but allure us from evil. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of God, Son, the King, and the Holy Spirit, with you all go in peace. The peace of the Lord. Um, be with you all.